Well, it's my very great pleasure this morning to be talking to Mark Dury. So, um, Mark, uh, could you just tell us a little? I mean, I think you're an extraordinary human being with just so much to offer. Uh, you're one of the most gracious, thoughtful, intelligent, insightful people on so many issues. Uh, that's because I've known you for many, many years, but others who are listening may not know you. So give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of your background and, uh, yeah, what, what brings you to this point and why we should listen to you talk <laughs> to us and have a conversation around Afghanistan and the Taliban and jihad. Sure, Mark. Well, I, I'm, I'm an Anglican pastor. Um, I've been a Christian all my life, and uh, for about 20 years I was an academic in linguistics and taught and researched at leading universities and uh, was head of linguistics at Melbourne University. And I felt called into pastoral ministry, so I uh, left that behind and studied theology and retrained, and I spent 21 years in uh, parish ministry in the Anglican Church. But um, my original field work for my PhD in linguistics was in Aceh in Indonesia, which is a very Islamized society, uh, increasingly so. And this opened my eyes to aspects of Islam. And then after 9-11, I devoted myself to studying about Islam and uh, teaching and equipping the church. Um, so it's been a really uh, fascinating, for me, <laughs> interesting journey. Yeah. Uh, including pastoring a congregation of Muslim background believers in in Melbourne, uh, we've we've baptised more than 150 uh, people. They're mostly Iranians, um, but these days I I devote myself to teaching uh, Islamics and pastoral theology for uh, Melbourne School of Theology, and I also um, write and teach and do training, equipping the church to understand the times. Uh, that we live in uh, very significant issues that are facing Christians in on, in, on many different fronts. Uh, well, and um, you thought one PhD wasn't enough, so as part of your journey in uh, getting to understand Islam, you did some more studies. So what you have a second earned PhD. Tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, I was, I was really fascinated with the question of why there's so much biblical materials in the Quran. And what does it mean that there's so much of the Bible in Islam? And so I pursued that over many years. And the outcome uh, was I actually really wanted to write a book, an academic book. Um, and it seemed like a good way to do it was to do a PhD. So right. um, in 2016, I finished the PhD. And in 2018, I published uh, the Bible and it's uh, sorry, the Quran and its biblical reflexes. And uh, I was really arguing that um, the, the, the Quran uses the Bible, but it doesn't comprehend it. it. It doesn't import biblical theology in any way. So in a sense, you could say I was arguing against the Abrahamic thesis that Judaism, Christianity and Islam are on a family tree of related religions. Um, I concluded that Islam is actually, in a sense, genetically unrelated. It, it borrows a lot of material, but it changes it and re, uh, it redeploys it in, in all sorts of ways. So it um, it repurposes the Bible. It doesn't inherit from the Bible. It's a quite important issue. Uh, yeah. You know, you have people like um, uh, Archbishop Brian Williams in England and, and others who've argued that uh, Islam, sh Sharia, in fact, should be embraced in Europe because of the continuity between um, Abrahamic faiths. Um, it's not as if it's an alien religion, <laughs> you know. So, And you've got leading intellectuals in Germany saying that, Islam is native to Europe. It should be embraced as part of the European heritage. Uh, mm -hmm. And theologically, uh, I was arguing that that's actually not true. It's a very different theology. And so civilization building consequences, I think, for that. And it's important for the church. Like, how do we, how do we understand yeah. ourselves in relation to, to, do we worship the same God? Do we believe in the same prophets? What, what is the, is there a bridge of understanding or is it a chasm of difference, just despite the superficial similarities? Uh, and how, what sort of reception has that work had? Uh, is our civilization changing? Are European <laughs> academics uh, reading your work and going, oh my goodness, we've got Islam all wrong? Uh, uh, in the Christian Academy, has this been something that has shifted the needle on people who want to argue that we all worship the same God? That's an embraced? interesting, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I've been um, teaching and 
communicating about these issues for many years across many fronts. And I think some, uh, you know, some Christian leaders are, are waking up and, and understanding Islam better. Some parts of the church are, are well positioned. Others are in deep trouble. Academically, the book has been well received. The professor of uh, uh, Quranic studies uh, at, um, at Oxford University, Nikolai Sinai, gave it a, a great plug. He really loved mm -hmm. it. And Gabriel Reynolds is an American academic, one of the leading, Quran, probably the leading Quran academic. He really appreciated the book and did, wrote a very positive review. So, um, yeah, you know, it's been it's been well received. I, I I brought in linguistics and theology into the mix because Quranic studies people who work in Quranic studies are not trained in theology, so there has never been a, a really proper theological analysis of the Quran as a result. So uh, that, that, I think those two skills, linguistics and theology, has opened up lots of new avenues of thought for people. Um, so yeah, I, what, one keeps going. I've certainly seen many Christian pastors uh, change in their understanding and mm. rethink their position. Uh, and, but it's a long, it's a, it's a gener intergenerational task really to equip the church to respond to the challenge of Islam. It's, well, the challenge has been there for 1400 years, but actually it's an interesting topic because the, um, I think the church has made some really bad mistakes in its understanding of Islam. It's often thought of Islam as a kind of Christian heresy, sort of Christianity gone wild. And that's a really bad, uh, inaccurate way of thinking about Islam. But I think now, after more than a millennium, the church is beginning to understand better. And um, people like um, John, uh, uh, John of Damascus and um, Aquinas and Luther and others, they made that mistake. And, uh, and, and I think it's going to take time for us. Right. But the, the good thing is that we, we know more about Islam as Christians. We understand it better. We have better resources. The light is shining um, mm. into Islam. And so I actually mm. find it a really exciting time to be involved in this work. So that's a bit of a segue into the topic of the day, uh, being the uh, resurgent, triumphant Taliban in Afghanistan, because it seems to me... After 9-11, Islam became just the topic of conversation everywhere and, and the heightened aware of, of jihad and discussions about jihad. Uh, people were concerned about uh, Islamic immigration, about influence in the West, and lots of debates, lots of concern. And then it died down. We, we had all sorts of other things to distract us, and we sort of hoped that it all go away. The incidents of, of terror in major Western cities declined um, but now I suspect it's back. I suspect this is now going to be a new season of, of it being front of mind. And so I thought it'd be good to, to get your perspectives on, uh, on what's happened and why and how we can perhaps make sense of the Taliban. So I thought what, I, 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 what I'd like to start with is can you locate for us the Taliban on the spectrum of Islamic theology and practice. So Islam's not, there's, there's a whole range of views. Uh, some people will say, and you may already have heard this, uh, oh, the Taliban aren't, they're just terrorists. They're not really Muslim. I mean, I've already seen that trope during the rounds. And you go, hmm, okay, but no, they do claim a religious motivation. So, but not every person who claims to be a follower of uh, Muhammad is terrorist uh, or follows the Taliban. So where do they sit on this? If you can give us a, a sort of place them or locate them on that territory, that'd be very helpful. Well, I, I might just step back a bit and, and set it in the context of global developments uh, regarding Islam. Um, from about 1500 onwards, the um, Islam was in political military decline. It was being defeated on many, many fronts from Central Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Mediterranean. Um, and this caused a crisis because Islam is a success-oriented religion. It promises dominance to its followers, political, political and military dominance. Um, the call to prayer says, come to success, come to success. And, mm -hmm. and so from the 17th century on, there were um, a whole raft of revivalist movements. Um, the first probably Wahhab, in, you know, the Wahhabi movement in, in Arabia, but spreading into the British colonies and all across the Arab world. And these movements, which include Hezbo Tahrir, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Jamaat Islamiyah, uh, and, and the Taliban, 
um, all have a, this, a shared um, core idea, which is that the the failures of Islam to dominate uh, and to be successful are due to the lack of Sharia compliance, a lack of faithfulness in following the code mm. of, of Allah. So the solution to Islamic decline is, is um, the resurgence of the Sharia everywhere. So women are covering up to an extent which wouldn't, wasn't happening 30, 40 years ago. For example, um, just look at photographs of graduating classes mm. in many Muslim countries. So the Taliban is part of that, um, that movement. Um, the word Taliban means, I think, students, and they're students of Islam. <laughs> okay. um, they're not as extreme as ISIS. ISIS criticizes them for um, not being strict enough in Im imposing the Sharia. Um, but they are certainly a conservative Islamic. And people may talk about, they might use pejorative labels for the Quran's uh, views on Islamic law, but really it reflects, I think, orthodox mainstream Islamic positions that are embedded in medieval Sharia textbooks and were considered unquestioned, unquestionable as part of Islam until the modern period. For example, the seclusion of women, the control of women by guardians. This is just core Islam. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been the case in Saudi Arabia and in, in other strictly Islamicized societies. Um, it's just that the, the Taliban has, has not uh, conceded anything to modernity or to liberal views. And I think the whole of the Muslim world has really been struggling with the Sharia revival and its implications. Mm. And in some cases where um, it's been attempted, such as Iran, Algeria, uh, Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood, it's generally been a failure. Um, but so, yes, I would say the Taliban are a genuine Islamic movement. Their, um, their fight is legitimate from a Sharia perspective. So um, there's a principle in Islam that um, sovereignty should belong to Allah. So that, that means that um, the law of the land should be Islam. And when you have a caliphate, a leader of the Muslim global community, he, one of his responsibilities, one of the caliph's responsibilities is to advance the borders of Islam through military activity. It's, a, it's what's called a communal obligation in Islam. This is the, the Sharia uh, schools of the medieval period taught this. But when Islamic territory is occupied by infidels, by people who do not um, practice or promote Islam or impose Islam, then it becomes an individual obligation on every Muslim to go for jihad and to resist the oppressor. And this idea has, is, is mainstream and it's, it's had a big impact on the colonial powers. It, it impacted the Dutch in Aceh, where I worked, and mm -hmm. there was a 40-year insurgency there. And it was an issue for the British on the north, northern, northwest frontier. And the, the British dealt with this by declaring that the British Empire was an Islamic state. And, and they got fatwas from um, the heads of the Islamic schools in Mecca and from the Ottomans to support this. Um, and, and the problem with having um, infidel occupiers in Afghanistan is that even though they wrote in the constitution of Afghanistan, the new constitution, that the Sharia sat over all the law uh, code of the country, even though they created an Islamic state there, um, nevertheless, from an Islamic point of view, um, their very presence and dominance in the process made the Afghan government illegitimate. And so I think this this really has fueled uh, the resistance and you could take it down to a really a very basic question like if you're an 18 year old afghani and you're going to go to fight whose side are you going to fight on well on the one hand you've got people saying you know you have an individual obligation to resist the infidel occupier and if you die fighting you'll go to paradise and it'll be great and you'll be able to intercede for 60 of your family and if you don't die and you win, then that'll be great as well. You'll be a mm. hero. Uh, on the other hand, you can fight for the infidels. And, um, and when you die in battle, uh, then where would you go? I, uh, the Taliban will tell you that you're going to hell. And that, that religious motivation is, is um, really hard to eradicate and hard to overcome. You, you, what the Americans would have had to do is tell all of Afghanistan that they have the only true Islamic government <laughs> to overcome right. this. I mean, the other solution is liberalization. And, and yeah. that has happened to some extent under the Americans. But so, yeah, I would I would say the Taliban are, are, are a legitimate Islamic movement. 
their 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 policies are, arise from classical Orthodox Islamic teachings. Um, they are not aberrant. Um, they're aberrant from a Western liberal perspective, but and mm. and this is one of the reasons why they were so successful and why their final victory was so uh, rapid and lightning fast across the country. Everything collapsed when the Americans basically said they were going. So the question that went through my mind as you were speaking was, given that religious motivation, why did so many Afghanis support the US government, fight for the US, fight for the Afghani government, if that was the, uh, is it that, that they were the more liberal or modernity influenced Afghanis? Um, they just well, didn't believe. I think if you're ruled by a power um, and that power asks you to fight, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to refuse to fight? Mm. If, you know, if you're poor and you're, you're offering training and equipment and, and an income to support your family, and the alternative to that is um, poverty or lack of a future, uh, what choice are you going to what choice are you going to make? It's a it's a sort yeah. of you could think of it as a mercenary proposition. The the other thing is um, in is in Afghan culture, it's a very tribal and divided society, so it's not uncommon for people to switch sides. I mean, this happened mm. with the British and with the Dutch in in Aceh. You you get someone fighting on one side, they'd switch to the other, not necessarily completely honestly. Like um, sometimes people switch sides a number of times, so. They may well find it, you know, um, pragmatically helpful to fight on the side of the government, but may have no will to sustain the fight if, if the government wasn't winning. Um, so, you know, you join the side that you think is going to win. Um, so I think it's quite complex. I mean, you would certainly have many Afghans who would hate the, the, the Taliban and not want to give the Taliban power over their families and their wives mm. and their children. So that's quite legitimate. But to hate the Taliban and to fight them are two different yep. propositions. Like you should only fight if you're going to win. And wars are about winning. They're not about negotiating truces. They're about who's going to be the last person standing. And if, if it's not going to be you and you ha don't have a conviction that you've got the ideological will to fight to the death, um, then, then you, you, you yep. the wise thing is to take off your uniform and mingle with the crowd. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you, do you think this was, ever winnable for the United States. You use that term, you don't go to war unless you're going to win. And, and I wonder now, I mean, we're all experts with hindsight, but when you look back over the last 20 years, do you think it was a fundamentally poor idea, misconceived um, for, the, for, the, for the US and Australia to go into, into Afghanistan? No. Well, they, they won the war. They, they, they destroyed the Taliban and they eradicated Al Qaeda, but they couldn't win the peace. So right. um, it was a winnable short term war, but then you have to go and leave the country to the people you've defeated or, or, or others like them. It's um, the nation building project was a mistake. And I mean, I, I have some sympathy for America. They, they've been successful in nation building in Germany and Japan and South Korea. Right. Um, and they, 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 they were used to manipulating states and, and, you know, the South American playground they had. Um, yeah. But you, you can't impose, it's one thing to try and establish a democracy in a Confucian society or in a post-Christian society like Germany, but it's another one, another thing to try and introduce it in, um, in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And I think the, the irony in both cases was that in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Americans introduced Sharia grounded constitutions like the Afghan Consti the Iraqi constitution had been secular under Saddam Hussein, but it became Islamicized yeah. under American occupation. Um, but if you're going to take the Sharia seriously, the Americans shouldn't have been there at all uh, because yeah. only Muslims should rule over Muslims. Um, any other rule is not legitimate. And so it was, uh, yeah, it was a mistake. But the problem is the Americans didn't have any other um, framework for, you know, the, the, they could go in and fight the battle, but then to retreat and leave it uh, seemed impossible at the time. Um, mm. I think, I think it was very interesting in the, in the, in the nineties, early nineties, the Chinese did a study of America 
and they asked what made America great. These are Chinese intellectuals in Beijing. And their conclusion was that the American constitution would have been unworkable without Christianity. Um, and that is what made the, the structure of the democracy work. Um, and I think they were right. And you, you, you can't just impose that model. And I mean, I think the root of the problem is the West elites have a false anthropology. They have a false mm -hmm. understanding of the human being. Um, it's not a Christian understanding. And they also connected to that have a false understanding of culture and how cultures work. Um, the, the, the West, the liberal West has a very naive um, view of human beings. That is that human beings are basically good and for their flourishing, all you need to do is get rid of the obstacles, which are structural, systematic, political inequalities, for example. Um, yeah. the, you know, the ideology of the age says that. So you go in and you, you get rid of obstacles for women to progress. You, you get right education, you, you set up structures, and then everyone will say, oh, that's what we wanted all along, and we're yeah. going to flourish now. But, you know, yeah. sin is deeper, that runs deeper than that. And also some cultures... Um, have been deeply transformed by, say, for example, Islamic ideology. And that whole ideology is really inimical, I think, to, um, uh, to uh, a democratic worldview. And uh, so I think it was, um, they underestimated the, uh, mm. the reality of sin, the fact that, that sin mm. can be entrenched in culture, that you can't change that in a generation. It's a multi-generational process to to change the ideology and character of a culture. And it can't be changed from the top down. It, it's it, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, a grassroots process. It's, it's, that's, how, that's how Christianity yeah. changed uh, the Roman Empire from the grassroots. Not, I mean, there were top down processes as well along the way, but it was really from the bottom up. So I think, um, you know, it's really, it's really interesting. I, I um, uh, the, I've had a few interactions with uh, politicians and read, you know, the statements of, of the elite uh, people in government in the US, and they really have a sort of fairly universalistic view of human nature. And mm. um, it's a false view. It's not the one that made America great. And using that ideology um, has been, uh, you're relying on that ideology has been a mistake. For example, I was speaking to an advisor in, in DC to a, to a, to a senator, and we, we talked at some length, and he said, yes, the view here in Washington is that religion is not a cause of human behavior. Um, so people fight wars over water, over women, over money, over power, yeah. over whatever, but they don't fight over religion. Religion wow. is not a cause of human behavior. It's a symptom. This is Marx's view. Yeah. Um, religion is the opiate of the masses. Why, why is that? Because, you know, the, 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 the rich want to exploit the poor, so they use religion. Yeah. So the religion is not the cause of the exploitation. It's the, it's the means Correct. of the exploitation. And it's, feminists have a similar view. Like they, they hate they, some of them. I mean, I, I'm a feminist in some ways, but uh, some feminists hate Christianity. But they hate it um, because, of its, because it, it, it's a tool of patriarchy. You know, it's a... It's a, it's a means to manipulate and yes. exploit. And that whole outlook, which is so embedded in the West that religion's basically irrelevant, um, and, and you see it in, in the writings of journalists who, who don't get religion. I mean, it's just an example this week um, in commenting about um, the, the church that was had a service in, during the lockdown. But Correct. Um, the, the, they don't get religion. And so, you know, you, you, you spend a vast amount of money in Afghanistan um, a, a graveyard of empires trying to import an American mm. democratic model into a culture and a community that just doesn't get that and, and is wired very differently. It was always, uh, I think you, you can, you can point out lots of things the Americans could have done differently. They perhaps dealing with corruption differently or being more, mm. uh, having a more coordinated approach instead of having many different powers doing different things in different provinces, but fundamentally, they could never have established um, a government that could have uh, you know, succeeded, continued on after them. They were always going to lose to a religious group of one kind or another. It's interesting. I've been uh, reading a Yale historian, you may have come across him, called Timothy Snyder. So mm. um, he's 
possibly not in your area of expertise, but mostly Central European. He's got a brilliant book called Bloodlands, looking at Central Europe between 1930 and 1946. He's a, he's a bit of a polymath, speaks all the Central European languages, comes from a Quaker background. And he's done a lot of work on Russia and the Ukraine and thinking about totalitarianism. And he's developed this uh, philosophy of history or politics of history. And he says that there are two competing politics. One is the, the politics of inevitability, which is, uh, has really dominated U.S. and Western thinking. Of, and, and it's exactly as you described. It dominated U.S. thinking, particularly post-1989, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, end of communism, Francis Fukuyama's book uh, or article, you know, the end of history has come. There's an inevitability in the, in the U.S., Western mindset, particularly since 89, but probably since the end of the Second World War, this idea that there's an, in, if, if you, there's an inevitability to the triumph of liberal democracy. If you just remove the hurdles, uh, every sane person and culture will inevitably choose this. Um, and, uh, and, that's it, and I look at what you've just described in Afghanistan and I go, that is the politics of inevitability with a lack of understanding of the that, that it's not inevitable because liberal democracy is not a, I mean, maybe it is a bit of a religious view, but it, it failed to take into account the stubborn nature of reality. But then he contrasts that with the politics of eternity, which is, and he uses Russia as an example, that every, the politics of eternity is about every, uh, you, you, you never move, for, history doesn't move forward. You're always cycling back to fight old battles, to understand yourself as, you know, for example, in Russia's, what, what he argues Russia has done under Putin um, and, and the philosophers who've shaped him post-2010 in particular is cycle back to this idea of a thousand-year-old Christian Russia who are there to, us, you know, God's innocent, pure, anointed to establish, uh, bring the light of Russian culture and the light of Christ to the Eurasian landmass. And for a thousand years, they've been fighting endless attacks from pagans and fascists and of which uh, and, and so everything is always this eternal returning to this attack by the fascists on the pure Russians and Russia is always innocent any opponent is always all evil and I I was wondering about the sense of historicity and politics in Islam as you talked I was thinking how would we yeah you know, I can see I wonder in, in an Islamic sense there's there's no real future. There's no inevitability. It's always a, ret it's always jihad. It's always, is it, it's always a return to this revivalist movement, a return to the sources. Uh, Islam is always pure. It's always designed to be successful. So we were always going to be fighting the infidels who occupy us, who oppress us. And that is just always going to be the case. There's never actually going to be any progress. Does that, does that resonate in any way? Am I? Yeah, that's the script, you know, um, the, 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 there's certainly Muslims who still look forward to the fall of Rome. Um, they, they <laughs> conquered four of the patriarchies of the ancient Christian world, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Constantinople, and there's just one more to go. Um, and it's also true that the, 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 the jihadi sort of Islamic mindset is, is eternal. It has a, um, a very long view of history. Mm. The issue is not whether we kick out the Americans this year. It's, you know, but it'll happen within one or more generations. It's a, that sort of thinking. It's like um, you've got you've got some Muslims in North Africa who say they still have the keys to their homes in Andalusia and are waiting to get back in there. You know, or the Palestinians <laughs> who have the keys yeah. to their houses in in Israel. And, and so it's um, that that sense of history is uh, is shaped by the Sharia and the, and the and the predictions of the end times in which. Jesus comes back and he destroys all religions except um, the Sharia of Muhammad and oh. um, destroys the cross and the Islamic Jesus this is and and the whole world will be subject to Islam. So it's a grand, it's a grand oh. timeless vision. Um, and, and, and are we it, getting closer to that end time? Is that a, like, is that, do they have a... Do they have a Tim LaHaye, a late great planet? Earth yeah, the Iranians equivalent? have. Some of the yep. Iranians have. They look forward to the Mahdi coming and they see these signs and they want to be part of this movement. So there's yeah. some apocalyptic um, visionaries. Uh, mm. ISIS had this view as well. Um, but 
But the problem with that program is that for centuries it was failing. Uh, the West was defeat. I mean, the Russians had 400 years of victories against Islam and uh, on their southern borders, um, very, very bitter wars. And mm. the, the uh, and then you have this revival movement. And the biggest, I think the biggest problem for Islam is that wherever there have been attempts to reintroduce the utopian foothold of the future caliphate, uh, they failed. Um, right. Most Iranians now hate Islam yeah, after, since the 1979 revolution has shown them what Sharia law does. Um, many Afghans fear the Taliban. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was expelled violently and suppressed in Egypt after decades of promising that Islam was the solution. Nowhere has there been a successful um, huh. Islamic revivalist uh, implementation that has won enduring popular support. It has produced poverty, brokenness, oppression and pain. Yeah. So I think the Islamic, um, this, this grand narrative is in trouble. And, and that's really, in some ways, that drives the fury. Like if you... If your whole theological basis is coming mm. under attack, one one response, it's the cognitive dissonance response, is to double down and be more determined yep. in pursuing this, this fruitless goal. But you'll lose a lot of people along the way. And that's why there are churches in Germany uh, full of converts from um, asylum seekers who fled Iraq and Syria. And um, so the, they, they said, if this is true Islam, we, we, we want to follow Jesus really, really. So I think Islam's going through, uh, the most profound crisis of, of, and, the, and, and the crisis is not now the defeat by the, the, the Western powers, but it's the failure of Islam to, to realize the utopian promises. I mean, in some ways it's, it's, um, in some ways it's a horrible thought actually, but in some ways the best hope for, that for Afghanistan is that the people react against Islam and reject it. Um, mm. That won't happen as long as there are Westerners in there pulling strings and controlling the political process. It won't happen so long as Westerners are in Afghanistan. So That's the Westerners right. have to, because that, that takes away the legitimacy of jihad and, and, and the constraints almost, doesn't it? So you can now see, you can see That's what it right. is. Give, give the Taliban free reign, let them try and roll out Sharia and and wait for heaven to come to earth and and what you yeah, discover is it's more like hell let's see what paradise is like yeah, yeah because as long as you've got the infidels to fight against you've got someone to blame for your sufferings but yeah now now the taliban different groups will be fighting each other and they'll you know what happens when iraq fought syria is each side said it was a holy war and they they celebrated their dead as martyrs and that sort of becomes incredible to people it's incredible yep. to iranians they don't believe that anymore and that, that they're dead in the Iran Iraq war were martyrs. Yeah, and whereas the the Iraq dead were were are in hell. They, you know, this is hard to sustain in the modern era. I mean, the Shiites and Sunnis have fought each other on that basis for a thousand years, but it's it's hard to sustain. So, yeah, it's. I think Afghanistan's a really difficult um, difficult country to 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 bring peace to. But um, in some ways, it, I mean, I, it's, as I said, it's a horrible thought because I, I, I know that, for example, Christian converts in Afghanistan are under enormous pressure. I'm sure mm. some will be killed. And um, there, is a, there is a small but growing church there, and it's, um, it's, it's tragic what they're going to face. Um, mm. But, you know, when, when President Carter embraced the Ayatollah Khomeini and welcomed the Iranian revolution, thinking it would bring democracy, I'm sure he had no idea that the outcome of this would be uh, a vast apostasy with, with more yeah. than a million Iranians becoming Christians because they, they could see how evil the Sharia revolution actually was. So, yeah, you, you have to really take a long-term view as to what's happening in the world um, to, to look beyond these, um, these events, traumatic as they are. Mm. One of the things that strikes me, and I've seen this, in, is that modernity and the technology of modernity the internet is a genie that is out of the bottle and you can't get it back in 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 much the same way that you know the reformation of christianity rode on the back of the printing press and the technology that came in with printing and the district that that changed the religious landscape of europe um led to enormous violence and then maybe, depending how you tell the history of Europe, some, some semblance of peace between religions. Um, 
I, and I wonder when I look at Afghanistan and I look at Islam, is that is that part of what's happening, that this, the forces of modernity, of liberalization are riding on the back of this access to information and that you can't, you can't sustain the view? I mean, why can I – I can't sustain the view if I'm a Sunni that every Shia – person is going to hell and is that their dead a martyrs in hell and it's just it's changed everything hasn't it and I, I wonder in Afghanistan you even the even the Taliban are on Twitter and on their smartphones and 20 year olds and 15 year olds are all you know they've got YouTube channels in Afghanistan and do you think that's an Im impact and how do you think that's going to play out yeah I think that's a huge uh, shift you know you've got all the the young adults in Kabul watching Love Island you know this is um they're, they're looking at the world differently. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, someone shared with me that a third of, a bit more than a third of the school children in Afghanistan are women, are, children, are girls now, and mm. women's life expectancy have gone from 56 to 66 in the last 20 years, and almost a third of MPs in Afghanistan were women. So, you know, women will have different expectations. Um, and yeah, I think it's a very different proposition for the Taliban to be controlling Afghanistan now. And this is definitely an issue in countries like Saudi Arabia, and Iran, um, that, that people access through satellite television, they access all sorts of information perspectives on the world and through the internet um, that would have been unthinkable 30, 40 years ago. And um, Islam sort of maintains its control uh, by keeping people on a need-to-know basis. Mm. Um, I remember once saying to someone who, who'd become a Muslim in Australia that I'd, I'd read the life of Muhammad and the, the, the Hadith collections, and he said, oh, you, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> really? <laughs> and, yeah. Huh. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's two aspects happening in the Muslim world. One is um, realizing how other people live uh, and... Uh, having a better understanding of the choices that are available to some people and maybe not to me, and why is that the case? And the second is um, information about Islam is becoming much more available. And mm. instead of just someone saying, you know, Islam is perfect, and you say, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, people are asking, well, why is it perfect? What has it brought me? What does it bring women? You tell me that Islam is good for women. What does that mean, you know? Um, and, oh, I read this about the life of Muhammad. Did he really do that? Is that really true? Um, uh, you know, there's questions that, you, you know, right. once you just never were able to ask. One of the most striking things that my Iranian friends who've become Christians have said to me is that, you know, often in Iran, if you asked a certain question that would be uncomfortable for the teacher to answer, you would be severely rebuked. You know, you weren't allowed to ask questions. And mm. they all learned that. They all learned that that questioning beyond a certain point was forbidden. But right. it's really hard in the modern era to stop people asking questions. And that's, uh, that's um, you know, a big challenge, I think, for these uh, Islamist revival movements. They really need to exert a lot of control over information in order to maintain their power. And I think that's very, very difficult. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a... There's a move that said, yeah, yeah, it's true of every totalitarian dictatorship type government that they want to control the narrative, control what counts as true, what counts as fact, um, which goes, so it's, it's Trump, it's Trump's big lie. The election was stolen from me. I just tell this lie and I repeat it and I repeat it and I repeat it. And, and you can build a whole movement around that kind of, lie because facts no longer matter. And I, Islam has that as well. Like Islam is, it's, if you follow, if you're deeply consistent and you follow Sharia perfectly, you will be the most successful of all people. That sort of prosperity, as you said, success theology. You just keep telling the lie, uh, you know, for 1400 years. But of course you're right. Like it, most Islamic countries aren't prospering. Um, no, in, 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 in fact, you know, when you have, people living side by side who only differ by their religion, Muslims do worse. So Muslims are poorer than Hindus. Um, uh, Bosnia is poorer than Serbia. Yeah. It, 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 in Muslim countries too, Christians often do well, not always. I mean, in Pakistan, they're, they're sort of suppressed as like a low caste, but um, often their hospitals, their institutions yeah. are admired and, uh, 
they become the elite in Pakistan. It's ironic that the Christians are oppressed, but the Christian schools are some of the most elite schools. But yeah, um, so yeah, Islam does badly. If you look at the human um, development indices of Muslim states, they're they're very poor. And it's really interesting that Iran is one of the it's doing better than many. But in fact, in Iran, you've got a population that are that are rejecting Islam. Yeah, um, there's there's a cultural resistance to Arab culture and to to Islam. So yeah, it's. I think you know you can't lock up your women and expect your children to be well educated. You can't um, lock up your women and expect families to be healthy and uh, with with children who are have sound, uh, emotionally stable yeah. um, uh, upbringings. It's you, you, you can't practice the guardianship process in which uh, women are under the control of their male relatives, their brother or their father or their grandfather. And, and produce healthy societies. Oh. Uh, Wafa Sultan said, um, the uh, apostate from Islam from Syria, she said that um, the the uh, oppressed Muslim woman is the hen that lays the terrorist egg. Um, and wow. I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, you get damaged young men if their mothers are not well. And uh, these are yeah. these are really difficult and deep deep-seated uh, problems, I think, for the Islamic world to face. So uh, does that, does, do you think this means we are going to see, as you, you mentioned, laying terrorist eggs, do you think we're going to see an uptick in jihadi zeal or revivalist zeal because what's happened in Afghanistan is seen as a, as a great victory of Islam? This is proof that Islam is successful, uh, the great Satan, America, is uh, an empire in collapse, and uh, Christianity is on its last, uh, on its knees, and now is the time, brothers, yes. to. Yes, it will. It will give energy to that hope, that that um, world hope of world conquest and, and triumph, and it's already happened once before. We can see how it happened. So, when the um, Soviet Union collapsed, the jihadis said that's because we defeated them in Afghanistan. And there's a very famous book called Join the Caravan, which is banned in Australia. It's one of the first books. It took, took the authorities years to start banning Islamic texts in Australia, but this is one of the first ones they banned. And in the introduction, it says, look, you know, we have, we, the mighty Mujahideen, Mujahideen of Afghanistan have defeated a superpower and other superpowers will follow soon. So, and look, we've now defeated the Americans. So who else is yeah. there left to defeat? Yeah, that's right. So this will definitely um, uh, give energy and hope to groups in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in, in Bangladesh, uh, the radicals there, in Kashmir. Um, yeah, it's, Africa has a whole, you know, a slew of different jihadi groups that are, that are you know, yeah. play, plaguing Mozambique and Nigeria oh. and, um, yeah, so this is this is bad, and it's actually it's set in a, a larger ge geopolitical frame too. You know, the Chinese are saying, "You Taiwanese don't expect the Americans to stay with you, to stick with you when the going gets Correct. tough." You know, um, they don't want a forever war. They've told us that. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, but you, definitely there'll be a upsurge, I think, and it's really worrying for Christians because Christians are often called crusaders. They are identified with the West. Um, unfairly, because Christianity is an Eastern religion, um, but it, it, they will they will be targeted. And in fact, that's that's already happening, and and the world won't notice it. I think um, they won't it's, notice Turkey doing what it's been doing more and more. They, they'll overlook it. So I, I um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very concerned for the the intensification of the jihad. But on the other hand, as I said. Um, the, the jihadis have never been able to establish a utopia yet, and yeah. over time, over time, that 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 understanding will will spread in the Muslim world. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question for you that will be, oh, maybe controversial. Um, do you think we should? open up our borders and our refugee program to try and evacuate uh, and resettle any any person fleeing Afghanistan who wants to get out now should should we let them in should should they come to the US should they come to 
Western Europe, the UK, Australia. What do, what do you think about that? In, in, because the, the reality, the fear, and I, I, for anyone listening, I have no view at the moment on this. This is there's no there's no agenda behind except a genuine curiosity. Because the fear on one hand is, well, if you're a thoughtful jihadi, or you know, maybe this is a good way to get into into the US or into Europe or into Australia. Um, you know, you'll 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 slip in and you can wreak havoc. Is that a real fear? What should we do? If you were the Minister for Immigration, what would you do? Well, this is a really complex question. Um, there's no doubt that, you, that Europe's in great trouble. And uh, Bernard Lewis, more than a decade ago, said there will be majority Islamic states in Europe in this century um, because of immigration and then uh, differential birth rates. Um, and you know, I think Europe's in trouble. It will suffer a lot in the coming decades as it as it reaps the harvest of its naive policies. But many of those that were brought in were brought in for economic reasons, so that, like the guest workers and to mm. do all the dirty, dangerous and difficult jobs that um, the Europeans didn't want to do. So, um, yeah, and then you got the complication of falling birth rates um, in, in Europe too. But uh, I think... And I must admit, I'm, I'm quite conflicted about this because I've been working amongst Iranian refugees who have become Christians in Australia for the last 10 years. And many of them are incredibly cruelly treated by the Australian government. Yep. And um, it's like a perpetual uh, abuse of these people. Um, yep. it's, we, we have no idea. It hasn't reached the public's consciousness how badly we are treating these people. Um, and... Uh, that needs to change. So I think we, we can't just have this policy of saying that if you come here and we don't like you, we'll keep you forever as a sort of stateless person without Centrelink benefits or, 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 or support. And if you lose your job in COVID, then just starve, you know. It's, yeah, it's terrible. This is not, yeah, a, that's right. not a good process. But at the same time, I think we should control our borders and not just accept, naively accept um, large numbers of people from from cultures that are very different from ours. So um, I, it's difficult because one of the ideological points of Western liberalism is that all cultures are the same and they're all quite beautiful. And that mm -hmm. if you just throw them all together, you get this wonderful, enriched, diverse, uh, fruitful melting pot of human, human thoughts and perspectives. And aren't, aren't we all basically good anyway? So it's all gonna be wonderful. I mean, that is so, so wrong and yep. naive. So even when you begin to talk about this, you come up against this this sort of desire to affirm, affirm human humanity and all its diversity. And the, the, it, it, so I think we should be careful uh, who we let in. And I certainly wouldn't be, in, you know, saying anyone who's a refugee from Afghanistan we must accept. Um, certainly, there are some that 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 we've somehow entered into a, a relationship with, and they are being welcomed to Australia because. They might otherwise be killed in Afghanistan. Um, but I think we should be very thoughtful as to how we integrate those people into Australian society. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually opposed to unlimited immigration. I think the Germans made a terrible mistake when um, Angela Merkel said, you know, we're open for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but at the same time, treating people very cruelly in Australia is not, not the way to do that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think immigration, the, the Muslim diaspora is a big challenge for, for, for some Western countries, much less for Australia. I mean, the reality is in Australia, because of the government's policies, um, most of the immigrants that have been coming into Australia have been coming from Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia, um, India. Um, Islam has not been a major, uh, source of immigrants here for quite some time. Um, and so I think the, yes, um, the future states can be determined by uh, the growth of Islamic minorities, and maybe France will one day be a Sharia state. Um, I think that's quite a realistic possibility. Um, but uh, so I, I remember once speaking with, um, I was involved in helping uh, some pastors with a vilification trial once, and we approached a lawyer, and, and, and the pastor's view was that, you know, resurgent Islam in Australia could be long-term a challenge for the nation. 
But the the lawyer they were asking for help said, "Oh, that's a fanciful thought." <laughs> I don't right. think it's fan- I don't think it's fanciful. Our nations shift and change yep. uh, through demogra- demographic um, processes. You know, mm. destinies, nations rise and fall. There are lots of nations that were once great and illustrious yeah. that no longer exist. Correct. I mean, the Jews are an exception. <laughs> that's right. Well, Normally, you know, will Germany still exist in a hundred years? Perhaps not. You know, I. It's uh, <laughs> we, and I think nations would be foolish not to have some sense of of their of their long term future. Um, and this is a problem for Western democracies because we run on election cycles. Correct. Yeah. And if we don't have a, a, an ideological commitment to our own enduring um, future, uh, yep. then I think we are, we are in trouble. And and uh, this, I think you could yeah yeah this paradox of going back to Timothy Snyder, the Seattle story, and. It, he says, this is what you've nailed it exactly right, that, that the politics of eternity, the politics of inevitability rob you of a future that needs to be constructed and owned by serious people thinking about serious alternatives, making choices, and that that work can never cease. Like we can't just assume, which is, you know, of course, Australia will always just go on, Germany will always go on. We go, no, no, it doesn't. It's actually the future is constructed by on the basis of a whole bunch of choices that every generation has to make. Uh, and, yeah, and, and we can't give up on that. That's, that's vitally important. But, of course, what makes it hard, as you were talking, I thought the great problem for us as Christians, right, is uh, – we, we we have to, and for humans, we have to think at two levels. At one level, and, and I've seen that just in how you've described it, the level of the policy, the big sweep of history, you know, in, in, in 50 years' time, we might think the fall of Afghanistan, the resurgent Taliban, is the, actually the best thing that happened for that country. We can have a policy on immigration that says, no, we want to control our borders. That's the policy, the big picture. But then... Actually, when you look at the very human level, you say, you know what? There's people who are going to die tomorrow because of this. And, and as yeah. a Christian, like we, we value the big picture, the, 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 the empire building, the great civilizational ideas, but also we, we, we value the person who's standing at the airport in Kabul desperately trying to get out. Um, well, and, we have a, and, we, we, yeah, we have a residual sense of covenant in our culture that if you make a promise, you should keep it. Yes, and absolutely. If you if you entice twenty seven percent of MPs to be women, you can't just throw them into the jaws of the Taliban and 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 leave with your tail between your legs. You know, you you can't open up a society like that without being able and willing to um, follow through. Uh, so I think this is um yeah, it's just, it's a deep shame really that and it's very very painful to to think about. Can I just re- respond to something else you, you were saying? Um, I think a nation does need a big idea of its identity and its future. And one of the things that's most troubling to me is that a nation like America, um, European countries and Australia, we've actually forgotten uh, Correct. what has made us who we yeah. are. And we are marching away from it, you know, aggressively and rejecting its foundation. And one of its foundations is a particular understanding of the human person, that we are sinful uh, and that society needs to build in constraints mm. to manage that. That's why we have the separation of powers. That that separation of powers is because of the doctrine of sin. Um, Islam doesn't have any separation of powers and it doesn't have any doctrine of sin, and that's a huge world of difference. H- um, hang on, hang on. Just, just Islam doesn't have a doctrine of sin. No, it has a... It, has, um, it sees sin as a um, not a big deal, like... It's there's transgression, um, disobedience, okay. not not walking on the straight path, but it, but it's not a. It doesn't have a view that human nature is fundamentally sinful. Okay, human so, beings. So if you want cr- to obey Sharia, you can. If you want to, if you want to be a perfect human being, if you're rightly guided, if, yeah. if there's proper guidance, okay. gotcha. if you're following proper guidance, and also, it's not a problem for a sinful person to exist in God's heaven. You know, you, you, the, the atonement is not necessary. Huh. Um, and the, the, the view in the Quran is that human beings are born uh, Muslims, actually. They're born innocent, perfect. And, and the, the Islam's job is to make sure they receive the guidance that they need to stay on track. So human beings are weak and easily led astray, and the state needs to impose the truth upon them. Um, 
but but there isn't this view that there has to be checks and balances in that same way against the reality of human sin that that power can corrupt. Yeah, um, it's and and these these perspectives have been lost in the West, and so that's why I think the Americans fundamentally misunderstood the depth of the problem uh, with just uh, Sharia culture and. And they, they felt that they could just liberate people um, and that would be that. So yeah, it troubles me in the West that we've we've lost track of our of what are Christian foundations. I think the Chinese were right. Mm. Democracy makes sense because of a Christian base, but we've rejected the base. And and as a result, our worldviews are populated by a host of lies about mm. about ourselves, about the world, about history, uh, and we're trying to continue on uh, with these lies, uh, these bad ideas that have gone deep. They know that all religions are the same, that, that we are just basically progressing, that future generations will be wiser and better than us. These, these, these ideas are just, just very mistaken and they, they provide a very shaky foundation for the future. And that, that, that does trouble me deeply. That troubles me as much as the, the rise of militant Islam. Right. Because actually, I mean, in the end, the, as Jesus said, you'll, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free, but you need to know how reality actually works if you want to order your life and live well. And, and reality is, like with human sin, we have an ineluctable tendency to mess things up, and you have to acknowledge that and write that into your politics and into your economics and into your understanding of life. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, Sorry, um, it solves an instant after years in the gulag. He said the line between good and evil runs down the middle of every human heart. And yeah. he was speaking about the guards in the gulag as well as the prisoners. Yes, that's he, right. He, he didn't make any distinction between between them. There was no innocent party and no totally guilty party either. There was a battle going on for good and evil really in every person. And that that awareness is um, it's been lost in our culture, mm. I think, in, in amongst the elites. Uh, it still exists. I mean, um, there are still Christians around who have a, have a Christian worldview, but they find themselves speaking a language and living in a world that so many people around them don't know of anymore and don't understand. And um, so, yeah. So what? What then? Well, the quote Francis Schaeffer's great book: "How then should we live? Uh, what do you, What do you What do you do if you were to? You know, there's someone here is maybe listening or watching this who who wants to live as a follower of Jesus, well, what, what should we do? How do we, how do we respond to this in 30 seconds? Give <laughs> us the answer, Mark. Um, we need to the live 30 a radical... seconds is a joke. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to have a radical uh, Christianity, really. Uh, we need to be bold about that and unashamed. Um, the, uh, the book... Um, um, yeah, I'm just trying to, uh, I, won't, I won't go down the track. So we need to be, um, really a plea, uh, comfortable to be different from the society around us. We need to resist that inner, um, push to silence ourselves because we're saying something that people might think is, um, is politically incorrect or, uh, not in, co not in keeping with the, the mood of the times. Um, we, we need a, um, a really, uh, kind of in your face <laughs> capacity to hold our ground in the face of uh, all the pressure in our culture. So I, I, we need to follow Jesus. You know, we need to believe in the God who determines the destiny of nations. Uh, we need to believe in a God who, a God of miracles and a, a God who saves. We, we need to believe in the reality of divine judgment of heaven and hell. Uh, we need to have confidence in, in our understanding of the of the of the political world, um, we need to have a Christian a commitment to a Christian view of marriage, um, of of freedom, of of the human person. Um, I think one of the most important topics in all this is our anthropology. We need a biblical understanding of what it means to be human, and and that is where I think often Christians have lost the plot, and and they've bought into the view of the human person that's become dominant in our in our culture um I, I was just there's a book that's recently been published um uh rod dreyer um 
has written a book on the radical Christianity, and um, he argues live not that, by lies. Yeah, live not by lies. So he argues yep. that Christians in the West should follow the same strategy that Christians followed under communism, mm-hmm. um, which actually enabled the church to survive and flourish when communism fell. Which is basically you go underground, you create communities, um, distinctive communities of of faith that are separate from and and in some ways at odds to the culture around them. And you train people for persecution. You train them for authentic self-differentiation in the face of a society that's going in a different direction. And uh, so live not by lies, I think, is a, has lots of helpful thoughts. So I think every pastor should think about that. How can I train my the children in our church for persecution? Because that's that's really a question that kind of brings things into focus. What does that mean to be equipped um, mm. to be willing to to suffer for Christ's sake, to to speak the truth. I think that's that's where we are now in in in, in Western culture. It's um, uh, it's very challenging because I suspect you're not going to build a mega church in Australia on that basis. Uh, and sometimes I think, as Christians, and maybe I look back on my life and ministry and. What I've done is tried to equip you for uh, how to succeed in this culture, you know, like actually instead of being different, so highly assimilated, highly enculturated, but realizing, and, and so there's this deep discomfort and maybe it's just the context in which I have led churches in a city elites, <laughs> the thought of not being part of that private school, university economic political elite is is deeply distressing to many in our churches um so i wonder the thought that went through my head then was if you were starting out your career do you think you could have had the level of academic success you'd have a place in the academy as we're holding the views you hold now and living this kind of distinctive life is there still scope and place for christians to to have roles of influence i think it's very difficult uh yeah one of my dear friends was a leading publisher and she's become a, a strong Christian. And she said to me one day, look, um, I, I won't be able to continue in, in that particular space doing books for children that liberal secular publishers accept anymore because they'll be asking me to put certain themes into storylines and so on that I just can't do. I, I mean, I, in one sense, I left the Academy. I was elected to the Australian Academy of Humanities in 1992 when I was 34. I'm still a member of that, but I know that quite a lot of my other linguist colleagues there think I've lost the plot and become some kind of extremist. Um, yeah. And uh, that is just what it is. And I mean, I've, I, I think I've counted myself fortunate not to be in the academy over the last um, 20 or so years. Um, and I have a freedom to write and publish and communicate outside of that. And I, I'm really thrilled to be part of a a wonderful team at Melbourne School of Theology, which is teaching Islamics and seeking to train a future generation. So, um, yeah, I think uh, it was a window in time when I was able to exist in the academy and now it's harder. I think certainly there have been Christians that have lost their jobs and found it difficult to function in that space, but that doesn't mean we should give up on it. And I think we, we need to encourage Christians to get involved in politics but in order to do that, in order to function in the elite, if you like, they need to be literate. They need to be theologically able to read the times and to position themselves well. So I would encourage someone in your position um, to to equip your young people to serve. We, we mustn't surrender the public square. Mm. Like if we lose it, that's one thing. And we need to be ready for the possibility of losing it. But we shouldn't just walk away from it. It's It would be a crime to do that. You know, Jeremiah, it says to the, the Jews in exile in Babylon to seek the well-being of the mm. city in which they live. And we have a fundamental responsibility to engage and to do that, not to become separatists. So it's a paradox, really. You prepare your, your, your church for persecution and, and to be a despised minority. But you do, while you're doing that, you don't walk away from the responsibility of serving. I mean, this was Daniel's role. He was he was serving yeah. a pagan emperor, um, and even at the cost of his life. Uh, but he was he remained true to his own distinct uh, identity and faith. And um, 
And we need that sort of Daniel spirit in this time. That this is this is the time to think about what does it mean to be a Daniel in in a in a in a waning West. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, uh, Mark, that's probably a good note on which to wrap up. I just want to thank you so much for your generosity of your time and your thoughtfulness. It's, um, I, mean, I feel like we could sit and talk about some of these things for hours and hours <laughs> and hours, but, and maybe we should do, do a bit more of that because I hope it's been, um, I hope anyone who's watching this and who listens in finds this helpful and inspiring and we'll keep the conversation going and the, and the movement of equipping people to live authentic lives, like following Jesus from the inside out, with everything we've got for the good of the city, the good of the country, the good of the world. That's, that's what it's about. So thank you very, very much for being part of this. And um, It's such a privilege, Mark. I've really enjoyed talking about these things that are so important for us all. Yeah, brilliant. I'm just... Uh,